welcome. What a blessing to see all of you gathered and assembled as we meet to worship the Lord this morning and to observe the Lord's table. Let me give a few announcements that pertain to today as we're gathered back together in the Lord's table. Then we'll begin uh, our time of worship together. Uh, first, thank you all for arriving early so the deacons could get you seated and set up. Thank you for the flexibility uh, you're all showing with these arrangements, especially as some Sundays will utilize the fellowship hall, or each Sunday for some of you will, will utilize the fellowship hall. But, but very grateful for everyone working together, pulling together uh, to enable us to carry out this plan. So I did put more seating charts in the back. If you don't have one, you want to try to remember uh, where you are, you can get a copy of that. Uh, the deacons will help you each morning as they've done today. And of course, we do have the broadcast over in the fellowship hall. And the deacons know how to set that up and run it. And Beth's also available. Uh, if you're watching that broadcast, there's any technical difficulties, uh, you can text her and she can run up here and adjust as necessary and keep things running smoothly. So grateful that we can be together. Of course, now that we are regathered, do keep in mind, let's be mindful of the health recommendations, especially on you know, our spacing, traffic flow. We, we do have the fellowship hall open. If you need the restroom, that's the best place to go. Uh, as we come in and out, let's still be mindful of spacing, especially as we go into the next few months, and trust that God will take care of us. We'll be able to continue to do this. So then secondly, with us being gathered back together today, we're going to observe the Lord's table. We started making plans for this some time ago, but, but the supplies you received when you came in, they were back-ordered, and we had to find a place that had them, and then when we finally did, it got close to the regather date, and we thought, how wonderful would it be to, on the first Sunday back together, observe the Lord's table. So I'm really grateful that worked out. So you should have received elements when you came in. If you didn't, EL's here, let him know, get his attention, uh, and, and get an get a individually wrapped uh, bread and juice there. We'll, we'll give the instructions for... Uh, how to do it when the time comes. I think it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, but we'll give you a moment for that uh, when we come to observe the Lord's table. We did put a trash can in the narthex. When you go out, you just drop your trash there, uh, and everything should be good to go. And, and that'll be a blessed time together. Last announcement I need to make. We have several sessional record books that our church keeps in trying to maintain our history and our records. And we've discovered one of those is missing. It's marked Sessional uh, Record Book 1. Oh, Rick told me, and he's not here. It's, it's 1 or 3, but it, you'll know it if you have it. And I don't know, maybe some of you have insomnia, and you thought that would help. But uh, if you have the Sessional Record Book, uh, just please let us know that. Return that so that we can keep those records complete. And, and ideally keep those here on site. You're welcome to look any time, but, but we do want to keep them here on site. So help us out if you know anything about that book. And then lastly, I said lastly already, I'll say it more time, to, to you worshiping online. We welcome you as well. Uh, trust that God will continue to guide you, give you wisdom uh, on where you're worshiping and how. And if you uh, choose to return here to the assembly, just let us know, let me know. And we'll plan a space for you. Well, let's give our attention to the front of the bulletin. We have this prayer here of Psalm 28 recorded for us. I want to read that prayer. God calls us to worship through his word. So let's hear his word now and then enter into worship. Psalm 28 reads, To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help as I lift up my hands toward the most holy place. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors but harbor malice in their hearts. Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done and bring back on them what they deserve. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Come, let us worship the Lord. 
Father in heaven, we pause to recognize this morning that we are in your presence and ask by your grace that you would be present with us. Thank you for inviting us into worship, creating us as, as creatures who were made for worship, and by grace, saving us, changing our hearts so that we want to worship you and worship you appropriately, acceptably, according to your word. We pray, God, that this morning you would be glorified in this assembly, that the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would be high and lifted up, that Christ and his grace, his gospel, would be central in all we do, and that we would give glory to you, and that we would know grace. So, Lord, please forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of the sins that make us unworthy of fellowship with you, the defects in our life and in our worship, God. Forgive us, cleanse us, and thank you for the mercies of God that are new every morning, the, the mercies and the grace that are greater than all of our sin. Lord, thank you that we can gather together this morning and commune with you and one another at your table. We pray you would bless the time this morning, that it would be good fellowship with you and with one another Again, that you would give us the grace we need. Lord, preserve us during these times as we think of the coming months and what that may mean for health and other concerns. Lord, give us grace. Show us mercy. Do not treat us as our sins deserve, but please preserve the lives of your people here and help us to follow you and to wait on you and to know sustaining grace and hope during these times. Thank you that you are a refuge in whom we can trust. We pray we would know that grace. Lord, we look to you, we trust in you, because you are our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. communion hymn. Turn with me this morning to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2 in the New Testament scriptures. We'll come one last time to this passage today from 2 Thessalonians 2. We'll begin our reading at verse 9, which is right in the middle of the discussion. We've looked at the ideas leading up to it, so we can begin there. Begin at verse 9, and then we will read until the end of the chapter, verse 17. 
So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll read 9 through 17. Let the Bible open, let me lead us in another word of prayer for God to open our eyes. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the mercies of God, which are new every morning. And we pray that as we read the word, as the word is preached, as the word is administered in a few moments visibly, that you would open our eyes to see, give us ears to hear, uh, give us hearts that respond with faith, obedience, thanksgiving, uh, fear and trembling before your word, and a holy awe of God and his grace. Without you, we can do nothing, but with you all things are possible. And Father, as we pray for ourselves this morning, remember those who are involved in ministry, preaching the gospel. We pray you would bless them. We think especially of the Child Evangelism Fellowship and ministries like SC Best, which are either interrupted or, or in quite different operating modes during this time. I pray you would bless them, give them wisdom on how to operate, and please use it to your glory. Even if it's different, disappointing, just not, not what we're used to, I pray you'd still be pleased to use it for the sake of those who need the Word of God, whose souls need mercy through these ministries. Please remember other churches. We think of Dan Coleman at Providence and Todd Bookner at Reedville, Jonathan Davis trying to start Resurrection Prez, even in the midst of this season. Lord, be with them. You promised to build your church, save sinners, mature and perfect the saints, reform worship, revive your kingdom. Be pleased to work graciously for the sake of your name. Again, as we look to your word, speak to us, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. Let's hear the word of the Lord. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceived the, deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed word. Amen. All four Gospels contain the story of Peter's denial of Jesus. In all four accounts, Jesus predicts the disciples will desert him when he is arrested, and each time Peter affirms that he will stay loyal to the Lord even unto death. And each account records that when pressed by the crowds three times, Peter denied that he knew Jesus. But Luke's account is unique in that it gives us a window into the spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes of Peter's denial. Luke 22 records these words. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Strengthen your brothers. Here, Jesus tells us the ultimate source of the temptation for Peter's denial would be none other than Satan himself. That Satan would make an assault on Peter's faith in the hour of trial. But what Jesus also tells us, what he tells Peter there, is that Jesus' prayers for his faith would guarantee that ultimately... Peter's faith would not fail, fail completely and ongoing. So essentially, you have on the one hand, here's what Satan's 
trying to do, snuff out his faith. But on the other hand, here's what God will succeed in doing, preserving Peter's faith. And yes, while Satan would try to get Peter to fall away from the faith, and, and for a while Peter would stumble, yes, in the words of Proverbs 24, 16, though the righteous stumble six times, yet, or do the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. Ultimately, because of God's sustaining grace, Peter would rise again from his time of betrayal, and he would return to the Lord in faith. And he would do so because, as 1 John 4, 4 puts it, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So as we conclude this passage today, I want to highlight the contrast between what Satan tries to do and what God successfully does. And don't get me wrong. This passage does speak of satanic deception that causes souls to perish. It's one of those passages that makes us uh, be sober, serious, even tremble. But it also highlights, and it concludes on this note, of emphasizing God's power to overcome deception for his people. It even places the deceiving activity of Satan under God's ultimate control. So one last time together, as we look at the passage, we'll celebrate that Jesus is coming. And before he does, let me give you a warning and an encouragement. So first, the warning. Delusion will blind you if you do not believe. Delusion will blind you if you do not believe. For the past three weeks, we've looked at Paul's description of two events that must take place before the Lord returns. Widespread rebellion against the Christian faith and the appearance of the man of lawlessness. Within the church, there will be those who reject the Christian faith. There will be professing believers, even sections of the church visible that will fall away from following the orthodox faith. It could be through liberalism, denial of the supernatural. It could be through the prosperity gospel, promising material blessings that, that ignore the spiritual realm, whatever it may be. There is this season that will come when there will be this rebellion against the biblical orthodox faith. And such rebellion will be encouraged by a man of lawlessness, an authority figure who will ask Christians to be loyal to him and to his values, the affairs of the world and worldliness, rather than fully loyal to Jesus Christ. Now, as Paul tells us, such forces are already at work in the world, that they have been throughout redemptive history. They will continue to be at work until God decrees that the time has come for the final manifestation of these events. And then, as verse 8 says, the lawless one will be revealed. Now, what I want to highlight in the warning today is how the lawless one seeks to deceive people. And why you must believe the truth of the gospel before it is too late. So look at verses 9 and, the, and half of verse 10. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Quite simply, the coming of the lawless one is visually impressive. He displays power. Remember what Daniel 11.38 says. He will honor a god of fortresses. He offers people the security and the strength they crave in this world. Verse 9 also says he performs signs and wonders. That sounds religious in nature and fits what we read in Revelation 13. I won't turn there again, but again, two beasts function throughout the ages. One beast sounds like a governmental authority, and the second beast has religious Qualities. Those are the two forces that vie for people's uh, affection in this world. And concerning the second beast, John says, it performed great signs. 
even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in the full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. So in other words, this second religious beast, he performs signs that mimic, that parody Christian ministry. So whether we look at them literally or symbolically, fire coming to the earth, those are the kinds of things prophets do throughout uh, the ages. So this second beast, it does Christian-like things, religious-like things, and it causes people to be loyal to the first beast, these anti-Christian, world-based affairs and impressive signs. Now, in verse 10... Or let me back up. Hold on. Before I leave that, the, the second beast here, he, he's working to get people to give their ultimate allegiance to the first beast. And that's why Paul says these signs and wonders, they serve the lie. Or if you have the ESV there, they serve what is false. In other words, they deceive about ultimate reality. Some people have come here and tried to find specific content for the lie, a specific lie. Uh, that Antichrist would advance. But I think the ESV is better. It's just general falsehood. That's what this man of lawlessness encouraged. He deceives people about what ultimately matters in life. That's why the Bible over and over again warns you. What ultimately matters is not your safety now. It's not your security now. What matters ultimately is the salvation of your soul through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ. The Bible doesn't say that's the only thing that matters. There's a lot of duties it gives us, but that's what ultimately matters more than anything else. You deal with that first, and then the rest of things ought to fall into line. So the scriptures are warning us. Sometimes religious authorities and governmental forces, they work together so that people will give their ultimate allegiance to something other than God. Look for their salvation in something other than God. Now look at verse 10, because this tells us why such efforts are often successful. Why, why do you have fake Christianity and other forces being so successful? Because they appeal to what people already want. Verse 10 speaks of all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth. And so be saved. So here's how it works. The evil of forces, that they appeal to people who are already perishing. And why are those people perishing? Because they refused to love the truth. There is a natural rebellion in humans against truth. Maybe that's because truth goes against sinful desires, asks you to give up something that you want, that you crave. Or maybe it's because truth uh, asks us to trust something we can't see. Which is hard for us as humans. We're finite and we're sinful. It's hard for us to, to look beyond and believe that there's an ultimate reality that you can't see. That's what faith is. Accepting that reality as real. But we crave earthly security. We crave earthly satisfaction. Uh, naturally, we love the darkness. Or, yeah, we love the darkness. We hate the light. And so outside forces come and they appeal to those desires. And find people who willingly cooperate. That's what unbelievers do by nature. They refuse to love the truth. If they love the truth, the truth of the Bible and the gospel, they would be saved. There is mercy available to all, offered generally and universally through the scriptures. God gives that free offer of mercy. But when people refuse to accept the truth, the truth that they are sinners in need of salvation, the truth that nothing on earth can save them, whether that's a powerful earthly force or whether it's their own good works. Uh, they refuse to accept that truth, that those things can save them. They refuse to accept the truth that Jesus Christ is God, that he lived, died, and rose again for their salvation, and that Christianity is good news for their soul and for the world as well. People by nature would rather trust in something else, something they can see. And keep on living then in accordance with those desires. Now that's by nature. That's what goes on already. But here's where this passage kind of ratchets up the intensity a little bit. 
Because it warns us when unbelievers refuse to believe the gospel, they place themselves in great spiritual danger. And listen to how they're already in spiritual danger of eternal damnation. But listen to how verse 11 and 12 speaks of a present danger. Verse 11, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. There's the same phrase, by the way, believe what's false. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. When a person refuses to believe the truth, when they delight in error and wickedness, then eventually God himself sends them delusion so that they continue to believe lies. Now, there's a whole host of passages we could look at that to reinforce this idea of a point of no return, so to speak, in which people's blindness, the more truth that comes to them, it will just reinforce the blindness. I'll refer to some of those passages tonight when we're in Amos. Let me give you this one illustration of this, though, from the Bible. 1 Kings 22, you don't have to turn there, but this is where the story is found if you want to read it at one point. It's a situation in which all the false prophets are telling King Ahab, go up, attack Ramoth Gilead. God will give it into your hands. You're going to retake that land from the king of Aram. But there's one faithful prophet, Micaiah, who tells the king the truth. If you go up, you will die. And when they say, well, why so many false prophets? Why do only you torment me with bad news? Here's how Micaiah explains why there's so many false prophets. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven, standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? In other words, who's going to go and get this king to go? To his death. One suggested this and another that. And finally a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you will succeed in enticing him. Go and do it. In other words, you've got a wicked king. He only wants to hear one message from the Lord. He's like people that just want to be told what they already want to hear. Go and be victorious. He's been warned in the past by this prophet. He won't listen. So all the false prophets who are not faithful to God, who tell him to go and do this, all the ones who don't want to repent of their sins and turn from their wicked ways. So God eventually says, all right, fine, I'll send a spirit and he will tell you what you want to hear. And the result will be your death death. So we have to ask this question, friends, are there any among us who refuse to believe the gospel? If so, why? The passage has highlighted that many refuse to believe the gospel because they love wickedness. So do you love wickedness? And if so, where, where is that getting you in your life? Where is that going to lead you after you die? Maybe you're entertaining thoughts of, all right, making that commitment, becoming a Christian, but you keep putting it off. Don't put it off. You are not guaranteed another opportunity other than the one that is right in front of you that God, by his grace, has brought you. Don't hold on to sin another day. You don't know when it will be too late. Do not be impressed by the things of the world that vie for your loyalty, loyalty above God. Please don't think when we talk about judgment, hell, well, that's just fear-mongering. That's old, backwards thinking that is the truth that God has revealed to us. That Jesus, the embodiment of love, spoke of often. And don't buy into this lie, too, that following Christ will be bad for you. It will be a great delight for your soul. It will provide the security and satisfaction that nothing in this world can ever give you. So it's the warning. Delusion will blind you if you don't believe. God himself will send it. So here's the encouragement for God's people. Jesus will destroy the devil and overcome his lies. Now, as we've gone through this passage, there's a few phrases I've intentionally skipped over. I was waiting until we had gone through the whole passage, and now I want to bring them to your attention. Look back for a minute at verse 3. This is the first time Paul mentions the man of lawlessness. 
And I want you to notice from the end of verse 3 how he describes him. The man of lawlessness, the man doomed to destruction. Look also at verse 8. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow or violently kill with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Paul warns us in this passage about what Satan will do through this man. But you know what? At the same time, Paul can't even talk about this man without telling you that he is already doomed to destruction. And that when Jesus appears, he will destroy him by the splendor of his coming. By the way, the phrase doomed to destruction also translated sometimes as son of perdition. It was applied to Judas. One who was controlled by Satan, trying to fight against Jesus, and in the end, was himself destroyed, and all he did was advance God's eternal purposes. No matter how much Satan may fight, he cannot thwart God's ultimate purposes. Now, before we say more about that, by the way, don't miss how this advances the point of the passage Paul trying to teach the Thessalonians, or just remind them, about the nature of the second coming. I'll say it one more time. Before Jesus comes, the rebellion will occur and the man of lawlessness will appear. In other words, you will see these events. And when Jesus comes, it will be a glorious appearing. He will appear in splendor. He will violently kill the man of lawlessness. In other words, the second coming isn't an invisible spiritual event that you might miss or some kind of higher spiritual reality, Jesus will appear. He will physically raise the righteous dead and everyone who's alive that believes in him will be caught up to meet him in the air. You see, there is a, there's a hidden element to the Christian life and maybe the, the false teachers were taking that just too far. There is a hidden element. There's things we can't see. Jesus is king. He's currently reigning. You are a king. That's what the Bible teaches. You are a priest reigning and serving with God. Now, you don't see those things. You have to embrace them by faith. There's a few Bible books where it just pulls back the curtain and it says, let me just give you a glimpse of what's really real. And that will encourage you to persevere toward the day when faith becomes sight. When Jesus appears in glory to rescue his people, to put down every force of wickedness. That, that expectation, it needs to shape your outlook. There's a hidden element, and I, and I trust you'll hold on to it by faith. But at the same time, not only are we waiting for that day to come when Jesus will appear as king, he is already, right now, exercising his sovereignty and destroying the works of the devil. And even in a manner we can see, and let me highlight it for you. Look at the contrast that verse 13 introduces. Originally, these are going to be for the next message, but, but they make a wonderful conclusion to this passage. So look at the contrast. Verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and through belief in the truth. Verse 9 talked about Satan's work to deceive those who don't believe. Verse 10 spoke of their refusal to love the truth and be saved. Verse 11 spoke of God sending them delusion. But, as verse 13 affirms, in the case of those who believe, it is because God chose them to be saved. Look at the details there of verse 13. Paul, as he often does throughout these letters, he gives thanks to God for saving the Thessalonians. And this time, when Paul gives thanks, he highlights that God's actions to save them proceed, precede, came before their moment of belief. He says God chose you as first fruits to be saved. God chose that in this area you would be the first ones to be saved. 
and he brought it about through his sovereign power. Do you remember how Paul even came to this area in the first place? Remember, Acts 16 states, the Holy Spirit blocked Paul and the team from going to Asia. They wanted to go there. The Holy Spirit said no. Instead, God sent Paul a vision, a man in Macedonia begging, come over to Macedonia and help us. And Paul concluded God had called them to preach the gospel there. So in other words, friends, the gospel could have gone one way, but it went another. And that was under the sovereign direction of God who had chosen that the Thessalonians, they would be the first fruits of the gospel. I hope that humbles all of us to know that our salvation, the fact that we even heard that we're in an area with churches, is God's gracious, sovereign gift. Sometimes when I read reports of missions work around the world, I won't lie, it can be discouraging. One recent MTW report, that's our denomination's missions agency, it described Europe as the new dark continent. It says, claims that Africa now sends more missionaries to Europe than Europe sends to Africa. Many churches in Europe are being closed, converting to mosques, museums, bars, and book depositories. In most European countries, less than 5% of the population attend any church. And in England, more than 70% have no intention of stepping into a church ever. Now, when you compare that with Europe's Christian heritage, or just think about those souls, that's discouraging. But I have to recognize the sovereignty of God and salvation. And I have to believe that words like Acts 18.10 are still true, where God encourages Paul to be faithful because, quote, I have many people in this city. God has his people throughout the cities of the world. And Paul preached in areas where there was opposition and where people fought the gospel. But when he did, Acts 13.48 was still true, which states all who were appointed for eternal life believed. God has appointed people to eternal life, and the gospel will come to them, and they will believe it, and nothing will stop that. And so while I lament the state of the church in Europe, I rejoice in the growth of the church in Africa that now sends more missionaries to Europe than Europe sends to Africa. So listen to this. In recent years, just in recent years, Africa has gone from having a majority of followers in indigenous traditional religions to now almost 50% of the African continent identifies as Christian. Some estimate that by 2060, so when our children, grandchildren are in their 50s, it'll come quicker than we know, right? Some estimate that by that time, four out of every 10 Christians in the world will live in sub-Saharan Africa. And we could go on, we could talk about the growth of Christianity in China, where the underground church has grown so much, communist leaders feel threatened by its presence. Now, isn't that something to rejoice in? That God is still sovereignly saving people in this world, even if it goes a different direction from where it's gone before, even if God sovereignly moves in ways that just make us stand in awe of him and give him the glory. Here's what I'm trying to say, friends. Satan will work to deceive. And unbelievers will love wickedness. But God has his chosen people. And nothing will ever stop him from saving them. In fact, according to verse 11, as we've already seen, the satanic delusion is under God's control. According to verse 11, he sends the powerful delusion. So that people will believe the lie. That contrast was verse 13 where we read God chose his people to be saved through the sanctifying work of the spirit and belief in the truth. The spirit works to separate you definitively from darkness unto light. And enables you to believe the gospel. And that happens because God chose for it to be that way. And I'll hope you even notice, it's not a perfect parallel between verses 11 and 13. In verse 11, God sends delusion 
Satan works to deceive. People choose to believe. God works indirectly. And yet in the salvation of the elect, God directly sends the Spirit and changes their hearts so that he gets full credit for their active response to the gospel. On one hand, people are condemned. They refuse to believe the truth. But on the other hand, when you believe, it's because God chose you to believe. Let me look at how Paul elaborates it, and then we'll conclude and come to the Lord's table. Verse 14, Paul says, God called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God powerfully calls people to believe the gospel. By his grace, they respond. And when Christ comes, they will share in Christ's glory. And think how that would land with the Thessalonians and how it should land with us, of people who are suffering, who have been rejected because of the gospel. God says, when I show up one day, I'm going to honor you. You'll be honored because you're in Christ. As I honor him, so you will be honored. You will be glorified in him. And so because of those truths, verse 15, so then... Brothers and sisters, stand firm, hold fast to the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Don't get duped by the false teaching again. Just listen to preaching that matches what I've already taught you based on the word of God. Paul will even say at the end of this letter, here's how you know my letters. I'll sign them with my own greeting. Don't get duped by the false teaching again. Stand fast in the Orthodox faith. In verses 16 and 17, trust in God to work. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, may he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Hold on to the anchor truths, God's people. You are loved by God, which reinforces the idea of election. You have hope. You have encouragement. God has made you promises. He has acted graciously towards you in Christ. And we of all people should be hopeful. One of the ancient pagan philosophers wrote, Best of all for mortals is never to have been born, but for those who have been born, to die as soon as possible. That's the hopelessness of those who don't know God. That's a dark outlook. On the future. The Christian is different. He has hope and a future that is as bright as the promises of God. The past is secure. God elected you. The present, or excuse me, the future is secure. Jesus will come again. So the present is secure as well. Because we have hope and joy in the Lord. And that enables us to abound. In every good deed and word. Maybe you don't have a lot of hope for the way things are going. Maybe you don't have a lot of hope for the way you act at times. The Christian always has hope because of the work of God. So, friend, what do you take comfort in? Is it when things go well, whether in your life or the world around you? Is it when you get your way, whether at work or in relationships? Friends, we take comfort in the sovereignty and the promises of God. That's our comfort. That God will destroy the works of the devil. God will overcome his lies. He will save his people. And he will take care of his people in all circumstances. And so as we come to the Lord's table today, that's the truths we gather around. We gather to have a meal together, a symbolic meal together with the Lord and with one another. That's where we unite. That's what we celebrate. And so let us give thanks and pray. I'm going to pray together. When I'm done, the ladies will play one hymn while I get prepared, while we transition to the Lord's table, and then we'll eat together. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you again for your love for us. May that love and grace humble us this morning. We have nothing in ourselves to offer, and yet we are loved by you. We have hope and joy. God, forgive us for when we entertain deception when we don't cleave and seek after truth. Forgive us for when we are hopeless or joyless and not encouraged in your truth. God, forgive us for when we disobey your commands and delight in wickedness. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, great Savior of sinners, who came down for our salvation, was killed and was raised again by you, that we might have forgiveness and eternal life. So now as we come to eat this meal together, 
May we commune you with you, give you glory, and know your grace. And may your word bear fruit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> As we've said several times this morning, we have the privilege today of observing the Lord's table together. And I would just remind you, I've already mentioned it in the sermon, but just remind us what our communion expresses, our fellowship with the Lord, our unity with him, and praise God, our unity with one another. That we can gather and share this common meal together because we love the Lord Jesus Christ. We rally around the truth of the gospel and we enjoy him together in the life of this church. So we, we celebrate this time together. Now, I would therefore give this reminder. We, we need to do this each time to, to be responsible to the Lord and his table and to watch out for your own soul. Uh, the Bible does warn against partaking of the Lord's table improperly. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about situations where there's great a division in the body and, and where there's people favoring some over others and, and excluding others. And just gives this general warning. Hey, Examine yourselves before you come together to eat this meal. In other words, make sure you're, you're in Christ. You know your unity with one another. You're walking in obedience to the Lord. It's not a call to perfection. We're sinners. That's why we need this meal. But it is a warning that those who don't know the Lord, those who don't understand what's happening at the table, should just hold off until we can talk to you, go through it together, and then celebrate the Lord's table Properly. So one of the ways we test that is if you're not a member of this church or a Bible-believing church, an evangelical Christian church, one that believes the scriptures, the gospel, if you're not a member of any church like that, just hold off. Uh, if you're under the discipline of any church where they've told you, please don't eat of the Lord's table, just, just hold off. And if that's your situation and you want that to change, then come and, and talk to us. But again, if you're a believer, a member of a Bible-believing church, you know and love the Lord, you want to be strengthened in the fight against sin, and friends, let's come and let's eat together this morning. Now, this is a little different from what we're used to, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So in a moment, I'll, I'll read 1 Corinthians 11 and pray. If, if you want to start getting uh, the bread ready at that time, uh, then that makes sense. But, but on the bottom, you can peel back this layer, that will give you the bread. And then, of course, turn it over. And then when it comes time to drink the juice together, you can peel that off. If you need help from a neighbor or you have a child that's going to commune, help them out. Uh, if you spill a drop, we will forgive you. Okay? I have authorization from the deacons to say that, I think. Uh, we will forgive you uh, if there's a spill. But we'll just go slow and work through the spine uh, and observe the elements together. And what we'll do, we'll do it one at a time. Peel, eat. Peel, drink, we'll do it together uh, as we normally do. But listen to the words of 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Father, as we gather in your presence, Lord Jesus, as we sit down to commune with you, grant us the grace we need. Strengthen our souls. Great, grant that as we look at these elements, just bread and juice, that they will direct our eyes to the ultimate reality, the flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
given for us to save us from our sins and by communing with you, by walking with you, by trusting in you to strengthen us in our Christian journey. Grant that this time we'll give that grace and glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So go ahead and open the bottom here and get uh, the wafer ready if you haven't done so already. Jesus says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus also took the cup. You can go ahead and peel off the top there. Or at least peel it back. Paul says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And in this way, we show the Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks together. Father in heaven, thank you again for Christ who meets with his people. And gives us the grace we need. Send us out in a moment with your blessing. And may we know your grace in the weeks to come. Amen. Let me give the benediction. Wherever it got to. And then we'll be dismissed. Again, just be mindful of, of our spacing as we go out. Fellowship with one another. Some of you haven't seen. Some folks here you may not have seen for many months. So fellowship and enjoy one another. And go with God's blessing. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen.